We live? Great. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here today to uh, uh, to discuss a little bit of the music of Benjamin Britten. He's, he's a really fascinating, fascinating figure. Periodically, you see in something like the New York Times or in BBC reports these surveys, as it were, of the greatest composers of the 20th century. And they're fun to read. And inevitably, up towards the top, you're going to see the likes of Stravinsky and Schoenberg. And Britain is always up there battling with them. Um, everyone essentially agrees that he's a master of the 20th century. Everyone basically agrees he's the best composer in Britain. That is to say, England. It's no accident that that's his name in the 20th century. Uh, and most people think that he's the greatest English composer since Purcell. Uh, that's, that's quite a lineup, and so his music deserves a good look. The problem for our vantage point, if we're going to take a look at the choral music, is that unlike Stravinsky, unlike Schoenberg, unlike a lot of people, he won't, simply won't afford himself into being put into an early, a middle, and a late period. There simply are too many things going on um, not quite at once, but it's as though he has this incredible compositional grab bag that he has to draw on. There's all, this is the great century that he's living in the 20th century of great activity, foment. You can go a thousand ways in composition. And Britton knew who he was from an early age and had a lot of things to draw on. Okay, well that's fair enough. However, it's not as though you can say he's a composer who wrote a piece like this and then never wanted anything to do with this again. He's, you can find commonalities between the early music and the very late music. You can find simple music that is very developed. You can find simple uh, for small forces music that is very simple, very difficult. He's all over the map. So what I'm saying is Britain's choral music, perhaps more so than most, perhaps more so than many, really must be taken almost one at a time. Well, okay, fair enough. <laughs> but in order to gauge some semblance of an appreciation, you kind of have to take the whole thing as it is. You kind of have to take a survey of what he has to offer. And what, I, what we have here are little snippets that are going into his life that I hope will elucidate how I think one should view the incredibly broad world of Benjamin Britten's music. He was, uh, his earliest composition uh, uh, teachings were with Frank Bridge when he was uh, not even a teenager, and truly, Frank Bridge remains his principal teacher throughout uh, the entirety of his life. Bridge, um, Bridge exposed Britain to the continental music. What do I mean by that? I mean, particularly the music of Albon Baer, whom he really respected, and he in fact wanted to study with Baer. But the rest of it, to bar talk to all the rest. Well, that was a problem for Britain because when he went off to study at the Royal College of Music in London, the name of the game to be a British composer was you write in, you might call it the pastoral school. You write music that sounds like Vaughan Williams. You write music that sounds like Elgar. This sort of thing. And that just wasn't going to do for Britain. His, act, his, his mind was so rich, um, it, was, it was so intense that he simply was not willing to settle on, this has to be my style. His interests were in the very broad world of music as it was developing at the time. This is an incredibly broad period. I mean, if you think, we're going to look in a couple minutes at some of his church music here. If you think of the music he was writing in 44 and 46, uh, it's happening the same time Stravinsky's writing the Ebony Concerto for uh, Henry Goodman. Uh, it's happening the same time Strauss is writing the Four Last Songs. It's happening the same time Oklahoma's on Broadway. I mean, this is, this is a really, really fertile, fertile time period. And Britain wanted exposure to all of it. And to use, but not for means of simply being all over the map, he wanted to put it to use. And he really had very little time for music that he thought was inferior at the expense of being nationalistic. So his three years being at the Royal College were good on some senses. However, he was he continued his private studies with Ireland, and that really is probably where he came into his own as best. At age 19, his first masterwork, his choral work, A Boy Was Born, uh, was uh, was broadcast on the BBC. It's a set of choral variations, so you have the theme. Let's take a listen to the theme. So we have some idea of what we're saying here. Oh, folks, actually, this is the first thing in your packet. There's a series of examples, so if you go on a page or two, uh, you can follow the score of what we're doing. Here. So yeah, so this is the very opening of this set of variations. Again. 
insofar as it builds itself around this is really the principal theme tone you may you may remember from your set theory classes that if this is the first note this D we would call this zero we would call this note of two half steps of two and then we would call that five so it's it's zero to five is the principal pitch class set that constitutes the row well what he does you can take that you can invert it you can retrograde and, on its head, it can go all sorts of places, and you have essentially the foundation of the school of Baird or somebody like that. And indeed, that's what he does for the first variation. You see it in the second variation, but it sounds nothing like the second being the school. It sounds nothing like Schoenberg, nothing like Baird. Can we go to please the next example, which is the uh, the fifth variation? This is so stunningly beautiful, you guys. This in the bleak midwinter business. Uh, let's let's put a little bit of it in our, in our ears here. And what's amazing to me, guys, is based on, the, remember that 0, 2, 5 pitch class, what, he, what you get here in this fifth variation, it's a series of carols that he's setting, and in this one, indeed, you have two carols on top of each other. You're getting them by means of simultaneity. You're getting sort of chords that are hitting at the same time. So you get instances like 0, 2, 5. Zero to, do you see what's happening there? He's not doing it in melodic succession. It's constitutive of the chord. 
indeed, this beautiful melody, which I thought for years was some ancient carol melody, he wrote it for this, shows hallmarks of being influenced by the 025 construct itself. It is so phenomenally beautiful, influential of the Berg school, clearly, in some way, and yet just beautiful in its own right. Um, if you could turn the page to the next example, guys, this was, it's Opus 2, it's a very early work. Britain never, uh, he never got to a point where he felt composing for a certain type of folk or a certain um, uh, level of professionalness was beneath him. Indeed, many, many, many years later, he exerted this very melody into the unison carol, the Corpus Christi carol that you see. That's the same carol that was in that those choral variations. It was not published by the composer. Or it was not published by the publishing house. It's his harp score, his organ score, and unison carol excerpted. This was music for use, much like you might find in somebody like Hindemith or somebody like that. It is a phenomenally beautiful set, a phenomenally beautiful carol. Uh, so he rose to prominence with this, but he really made a big splash in England. He went to America for a little bit. You can talk about that. For, there's a lot to say there. But he made his way back um, and really made his prominence as a composer of opera. In total, 17 operas, some of them sacred operas, some of them on sacred subjects, some of them intended expressly for church, um, some involving children. And he really rose to, rose to a prominence that um, made him, by by 1948 to be on the cover of Time magazine, um, the celebrated uh, composer that he was. And he, uh, this, uh, so he made his, uh, his big splash, as it were, as an opera, but he didn't stop there. Uh, you see aspects of this dramatic effect that he uses in his operas, and something like the absolutely charming St. Nicholas. We did this here a couple of years ago. And um, it is wholly, wholly accessible. So even after he had become the celebrated composer of opera by 1946, he's still writing, uh, the next year he's writing this piece for very accessible courses, piano duet, organ, strings, and percussion. And in the foreword, he says, listen, the string parts are not very sophisticated and can be played by amateur players, preferably led by a professional quintet. The piano duet part is also of moderate difficulty. The first percussion part is obligato and should be played by a professional drummer um, who may play as many of the instruments included in the second part as is feasible. The second part is ad lib. This is a man who was writing music so that it could be performed. He was not saying, here are a thousand forces, use it or else. And so music for use and, oh my gosh, how charming. Here's an excerpt, the next uh, example. Um, is uh, in the cantata, Nicholas is, uh, it's the life of St. Nicholas, and he's journeying to Palestine, and he's on a boat, and it's rocking back and forth, and uh, this may as well be out of Billy Bud. <laughs> Charming you to lot to do, which I know many of you uh, no, let's have a listen to this. Let's hear let's hear some more music. So uh, the next example, you to lot to do um, from uh, 1961. Already 47 years old and still writing this um, you might call it a conservative piece, but um, I think it's I think it's really very tightly done, very naturally.
what are some compositional things that you uh, observe in that? What sticks out? Does this look like the music of a disciple of Albon Bayer? <laughs> Does this look like someone who's just going to deal in the English pastoral school? What do you notice about about this? What can you anything you want to point out compositionally at all? Yeah, Kate. He's very economical with his motives. Okay. He takes, he takes one idea and, and stretches it. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Yeah. It's very simple. Yes. It's a, it's an, it's quite an accessible piece. Yeah. Well, take a look. So you have alternating high voices and low voices. You've got soprano and tenor, and then tossed off to alto bass. What about them, though? Are they in unison? What do you think, Kevin? They're in octaves. They're in octaves. Okay. Are they use just octaves? So there's something else about them which is kind of interesting. Here, how was it? So at the very beginning, soprano and tenor, what's the soprano got that the tenor didn't got in the second <laughs> bar? What what is it? A passing note. And then what happens at the next instance? Same thing. So you might say that one is an ornamented form of the other. What's the uptown word we have for this somewhere in the midst of history? It's called heterophony, where one part is doing something, and then the other part is essentially doing the same thing but dancing around it. Guys, I don't know of a lot of heterophonic choral music in early 20th century compositions, or really much since about the 14th century. Uh, again, part of the arsenal of music that he knew he could draw on to create this boisterous, wonderful sensation when he wanted. It's a delightful, delightful piece. Uh, we were saying this just a moment ago. I think this is a really, really interesting quote that he, he became celebrated within a very brief period of time. He was the most celebrated composer in England. Um, but his sense of forces, his sense of for whom am I writing? He was writing music. He spent his life as a concert pianist. Um, not so much, uh, not so much uh, solo piano literature, but really uh, song recitals all around the world with his partner Peter Pierce. They were celebrated and recorded for many, many years. And a conductor, and a freelance composer. He was not, except for a short period of time at the BBC. I'll call it beholden to anybody. He was a freelance composer. He took the commissions as they came. But I really think, in his heart, each of his children deserved its respect. And it was not simply the big works and the expensive works and the loud works and the works for a lot of forces that he considered to be great works. As late as 1969, the last seven years of his life, this is what he's having to say about his major works, as it were. Um, a good example of that would be the festival today, I'm from 1944, that you guys sang, actually. Um, um, uh, how many of you sang it? You, you guys sang it? You sang it? Yeah, okay. Uh, so this should sound familiar. The middle section of the festival today. I think I included this in your packet. So this is the B section, as it were, of the festival. Coming in his time in America, 1939 is when he got there. He had a, he had this great apartment. He was part of this house. Was, you know when you live in college and you have eight roommates, and you look back. You, well, you don't know yet, but you look back and you're like, oh, that was a really cool person. He was crazy. All I knew is that he didn't clean out the fridge ever or something like that. There was this house. There was this house that had this incredible view of the Brooklyn Bridge. I can't imagine what it goes for now. Seven uh, Seven Mata Street, I think it's called. Um, 
Auden lived there. Um, um, uh, Gypsy Rose Lee stopped by all the time. Thomas Mann, the incredible novelist, his son lived in the attic. Thomas Mann's son lived in the attic. I mean, uh, when he was in, in America, people were coming and going. He got to know this guy, Colin McPhee, who's a composer, also a an ethnomusicologist. Went around collecting melodies from um, far and away places, one of them being Bali. Britain performed with him. Take a look and tell me if this so sounds familiar to you. If it's true, but I think it's, as they say in Italian, if it's not true, it ought to be. <laughs> uh, so, uh, one piece we don't have time to look at, but you should really know about, is Rejoice in the Lamb, this incredible cantata, really, multi movement piece for chorus. Britain had a habit of writing music that was accessible for relatively good choirs, though on occasion he was disappointed with what he heard, uh, but still, accessible choirs. Um, that required a pretty good organist. And sometimes you might say he didn't quite understand the idiosyncrasies of the instrument, um, but he's good enough. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not obscene. Rejoice in the Land falls into that. It's a pretty hard organ part, but it was the first of a series of commissions that I just want you to know about this guy, Reverend Walter, Walter Hussey. He was um, a, a pastor in England, first at this church in Northampton, and then he went over to Chichester Cathedral. And his church took it upon, really, with his instigation, took it upon themselves to commission all of these really important pieces of 20th century music, and we have him and his church to thank for them. The first being Rejoice in the Lamb, but you're talking major composers at this time. This is an absolutely incredible piece by Gerald Finzi. I think some of you sang it for David's recital a couple of years ago. Um, and then it was the Chichester, so I, be careful, you, I, I always want to call, oh, I'll tell you what I was going to um, I always want to call this, uh, 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 Chichester Psalms of Leonard Bernstein, um, and then a lot of people don't know the Chichester Mass. I think it's a beautiful piece. William Albright, composer at the University of Michigan, died prematurely a few years ago, but it's a lovely, lovely Mass. Uh, so we won't have time to visit that, but Rejoice in the Lamb, perhaps more than any of the choral music showcasing Britain's um, dependence on personal not dependence, but influence by. In his life as a concert pianist with Peter Pierce, he sang, they sang a lot of, of early music. He sang Purcell. Britain's realization of Purcell's basso continuo lines, and indeed his additions of both Purcell and uh, early Baroque uh, uh, vocal British music is still around. And for my money, although it's a good many years later musicologically, they're not that far off. You have to change a couple of things in order to really get stylistically correct, but he's pretty darn close, and he really does seem to get the flavor of where Purcell is coming from. Um, his influences are, again, broad. The very lovely uh, hymn to St. Peter showcasing, so this is the, uh, the Alleluia in the track for St. Peter and Paul. This is the tail end of the Tuas Petrus uh, of, the, of his setting. It is that. Influences from not just, oh, by the way, guys, plain chant with Britain. There's examples, there's that, there's the opening of the ceremony of carols, there's plenty of, there's a good number of authentic statements of chant in the choral literature. There's also a good, I'd say there's probably more than that, there's a lot of statements of newly composed chant, Britain doing uh, stuff that sounds evocative of a Gregorian melody or Sarah Melody or something like that. No, he just wrote it. Um, he was just good at writing tunes that sounded as though they were old. Not unlike Vaughn Williams, 
uh, in that respect. Um, the, uh, there's a chant-like thing in the War Requiem that uh, you would think it's from the Requiem Mass. It's not, you just wrote it. Uh, to some extent also influenced by hymnody. And in the oddest of places, this is in one of the church cantatas. This is not in the choral literature. So it's one of those straddling that place between the sacred and the secular. But it's a cantata for tenor and countertenor, and that's it. It's a lovely, lovely piece. Um, but we have to acknowledge that Britain was truly the greatest center of the English language, of British poetry in the 20th century. He was going around doing these song cycles, these song concerts with Peter Pierce. He was not only doing old stuff and Schubert and Wolf and all that, but he was writing his own, his a tally of the songs that he wrote. Now, 158 is not an incredible number, but when you can appreciate that the people that he set really reads as a who's who of the history of British literature and British poetry, it's really quite incredible. It's really, really quite incredible to go all the way and uh, by the way, there are some instances also of him writing in Latin, Italian, in German, Russian, and also a good many are French. Yes, and he also spoke American too. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Don't dismiss, to understand Britain, the, the choral composer, I really think you have to spend some time with the melodies that are inside the songs. Uh, and even the operas to, to, to an extent. There is a great breadth there, and there's some really, really incredible stuff that I think can enlighten a view of the, of the choral music. But, oh, by the way, also not just poems, poems as they stood, but also his libretti for the opera, his libretti sometimes where he would take an ancient text or an ancient Chinese text or something like that and reconstruct and do it. This is really a formidable list, but just in terms of his knowledge of things. Oh, and by the way, these are just people for whom we have names. If you go through the Britain choral music, you're going to see citation after citation after citation of anonymous anonymous carols, anonymous poetry. This is a man who knew the whole breadth of the English language. When he was a teenager, he wrote a hymn to the Virgin. He was laid up in, he hated, he hated the school where he was. He was laid up in the infirmary. I don't think he was quite 14 yet. I think he was something like 12. And he sat there and he had this 14th century carol and to pass the time, he composed this 14th century carol set. What were you doing when you were sick at 14? I was watching Scooby-Doo. Um, so this, this, this knowledge of, of English poetry is, of course, going to make its way into what you might call the traditional part song. And in this sense, he's the natural successor to Vaughan Williams, or if you sang The Blue Bird or something like that at Stanford, this sort of thing. So these cool cats here, I really wish I had gotten to know these guys. They just look like they're absolutely crazy. Uh, this set was, a, um, was an anniversary uh, gift for, um, for uh, the Elmhurst, who were gardeners. I love this, this next example. Say it six times fast. Green room, green room, green room, green room. <laughs> you see what he's doing? Um, again, his, his, his um, understanding, his almost encyclopedic um, um, appreciation for, the, for what there was of the English language, he did not limit himself to simply poets who had names. There's an anonymous, uh, the carol settings, the folk settings. Um, probably the most famous is the ceremony of carols that he wrote on a ship as he was coming back from America because he missed it so much. Uh, but the studio where he worked, where he kept some of his books there, uh, this is called the Red House in Aldergaard. It's on the east side of Britain, of England. It's sort of a kind of uh, breezy, overcast um, English kind of town, seafaring town. Uh, but that's where he was from, that basic area. That's where he loved and that's where he made his home he appears for most of his adult life. Um, he started what's called the Aldergaard Festival. 
uh, of, of music, and that's still around. It's still a major, major music festival. Anyway, this is where he composed. And now the, the Britain Peers Foundation, which is a fantastic website and set of resources, has preserved all of that. You can go and you can see all of the volumes of poetry that he had, in addition to just about everything British. But his, his love of, of carols, um, of any sense of language. Take a listen to this a little bit. Using a cannon in that instance. I think so. I, to, so that's where my ears go. That's sort of you're in a really reverberant space, and he's creating an artificial reverb. Um, but E flat minor on the harp. By the way, he, he loved the harp. And this is the problem. This is an example of the problem of taking a small body of Britain's music and opining on it. I've seen commentaries on the harp as um, when Britain uses the harp, he's evoking childhood. When Britain uses the harp, he's taking you to a fantasy world, particularly in the operas, they talk about that. There's any number of ways that he uses the harp, and if you limit yourself to one genre or one set of pieces, you can really start break, con convince yourself something that may not be true if you don't take all of the literature. Um, but let's not forget um, that, again, late in life, just have a listen to this. this you don't have this in your packet. Everyone has agreed that this piece here, the Cantata Academica, written for the University of Basel, is in fact a serial work written on a tone well. You tell me, does this sound like any serial music? And this is the late, this is not A Boy Was Born. This is the quite developed written. You tell me, does this sound like serial music? President of the University of Basel, and that had been given as the 500th anniversary present, I would have ordered them not to perform it. Oh. <laughs> I've taken a minute. No. The, uh, an aspect of performance practice, my friends. I have presumed, and I, I've talked to a good memory of a number of conductors, that kind of, there's this sort of presupposition that Britain's ideal was essentially something like King's Kong. Boy choirs in a very refined, refined fashion. And only until, only recently have I taken to kind of checking to see if that's true. I found a singular instance, this is a very early letter concerning a boy was born. This is from the Britain letters, by the way, they're multi-volume sets. This is the part I'm talking about. I am keen, indeed, to attend as many rehearsals as possible and also to see that the boys are going the way they ought to go. And then the editor, the problem is the, the problem is this is the editor's words, but these editors did work with him for many, many, many years. Britain is thinking here about his preference for the raw, vibrant tone of boys' voices as distinct from the cultivated purity of the Anglican cathedral tradition. That's with respect to a boy was born. There's food for thought here, is all I'm saying. Indeed, it seems as though Britain, the reality is these are, these are the groups that he composed for. You have what you might call average parish choirs, you have cathedral choirs, you have a lot of choral societies, you have a lot of groups I've never heard of. I'm not sure that we can really say that, say something like, the Britain choral tone is this, or he had a preference for that. I'm not sure that that's true. Just some food for thought. Can we go to the next example, guys? 
This is from the very late uh, setting. His carol settings were not all, by any means, simple and utterly accessible. This is an instance of him using medieval carol settings in something that I think is some of the more difficult music of the 20th century. So since I was 19 years old, and I don't know how to analyze, I don't know what to say about them. If you look at the chords at the top of, at 22, how on earth he cadences in bar 24 to C major is I think really quite incredible. brings us to the War Requiem, which is, it's not only thought of as Britain's masterpiece above a lot of masterpieces, it's really considered one of the great works of the 20th century. Uh, what happened was in, in Coventry, in the city of Coventry, uh, the uh, city was bombed by a German air raid and the medieval cathedral was destroyed. They rebuilt a new cathedral immediately adjacent there. You can see that from you can go and see that right now, for the dedication of the new cathedral in 1962, or 1962. Uh, Britain wrote this work. So he used the Mass of, of the Dead, the same text that Mozart and Verdi and everyone had used. But what he did that was unique was he inserted poetry, Wilfred Owen, into it, a soldier slain in war whose poems are written on, on the battlefield about war. So what you have is a massive chorus, large chorus, rather large orchestra. There's an organ and there's a, a voice choir over in the corner. But then you've got a chamber ensemble and a baritone and a tenor singing essentially the parts of a German and a British soldier. Britain was a pacifist. It's one of the things that brought him to America in 1939. They were smelling war. Um, more to that story, but he was certainly a pacifist. You can see his pacifism in works like uh, The Voices for Today, which he wrote from the United Nations. Uh, there's any number of pieces. But this is truly the crowning achievement. It's not unprecedented for a composer to take a mass ordinary and to interpolate it on some level. Indeed, if you take the, the idea of troping in the medieval era, that's essentially what that was, more or less. However, Britain really opened the door to something here in the 20th century, which was relatively unprecedented at the time, and you have seen a lot of this interpolation business of a Kyrie plus a poem or a hymn plus a poem. Uh, I'm not convinced that everyone does it quite as well as Britain, but to see what he does with his poetry interpolated in. So there's, um, you'll get uh, the tuba mirum will go on about the, the trumpet sounding on the last day, and there will be a poem about the trumpet of the Lord, this sort of thing. So it is, it, it's really quite a masterful, masterful work, and you can go all day on its compositional constructs. It was, um, amongst the things, we're just gonna play the opening here, you'll hear at the onset a tritone bell, a C and an F sharp which is compositionally significant. But then you're also gonna hear throughout this, this struggle between, do you remember what an octatonic scale is? 
whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step. You're going to see the struggle between the octatonic scale, the uh, minor scale, all under the background of, against the background of the tritone being sounded. industry nowadays, people, scholars have, there's been a lot of ink spilled on analysis of Britain's work, and probably this piece more so than any, you can find commentaries all day long, so, and there are very many good ones, and indeed, it's fodder for analysis, there's a lot going on here, these are just two sort of compositional elements, can I show you though how at the end of the Requiem Eternal movement, the end of the Offertory, and the, indeed the very end of the piece, Three instances where he takes this tritone business compositionally and how he resolves it. It's one of my favorite chord progressions, and I don't know of another piece that does quite this. So we have the example of the Kyrie, which is in your packet. I think this starts at the Kyrie step. Ah, uh, Kyrie. So you note the tritone business between the bass. Okay. Particularly after all the tension that's been created by the tritone and everything else being. You might call that a modified Phrygian half cadence or something like that. I don't know what you would call that, but it is amazing. Um, it is utterly beautiful. My favorite, and of the many, many things that, that one might enjoy with this, one of my favorites is the way he handles the Plenty Sun Shaley of your, your next example, of the Sanctus. The heavens are filled with your glory. all that technique. Fantastic. So lest we think he was simply conservative, he's using 12-tone technique in the beginning and the end, but he's making it his own. He's, yes, he's inheriting, by, particularly by way of the words of the British tradition, the song, uh, the, the, uh, the song tradition, in some senses the moral tradition. He's taking church modes and doing his thing and chants and doing his own thing. He has this incredible grab bag. And the only reason that it works so well as it does is because he is just that good. And I really think he is. 
Um, every single piece that's on the cover there, the, the list of the core works, really needs to be taken on its own and appreciated for what it is. Uh, let's give the last word, if we could, to, do you know this book, The Rest is Noise? It, read it over the summer. It's just the most wonderful narrative of 20th century music that I know of by, uh, by Alex Ross. This is, um, well, let's speak for itself. Britain had long admired Shostakovich's music, as the Lady Macbeth-like Pasacaglio and Peter Grimes shows. Shostakovich, for his part, knew little of Britain's music before the summer of 1963, when he was sent the recording and score of the war record. He promptly announced to his old friend Isaac Lippmann that he had encountered one of the, quote, great works of the human spirit, unquote. In person, he once said to Britain, quote, you great composer. I little composer. Britain's psychological landscape, with its undulating contours of fear and guilt, its fault lines and crevices, uh, its waning redeeming light, made Shostakovich feel at home. I think we've got really one of the greats here, and every piece deserves uh, to be at once appreciated for what it is and appreciated in its, in its total context. Thank you all very much.